Well, good morning. It's so good to be here. You know, <clears throat> it wasn't that long ago that I found myself looking for a place to eat at. I had just gotten home from the airport, and it was already 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the evening, and I was starving. Unfortunately, this was on the 1st of January of this year, and everything was closed. I tried a couple of places, but uh, no luck. So I got my handy-dandy phone out and searched on Google for big food portions near me. <laughs> and a list of restaurants pop up, and a lot of them are closed. And some of the ones that are open, they have uh, bad reviews, so not really interested. But eventually, I stumble across a particular restaurant, a Mexican restaurant that I had never been to before, and it was only five minutes away from where I was. And it had five-star reviews. And I start scrolling through the comments, reading these reviews, and there's a word that keeps popping up, and that word is the best. This is the best taco place that I've been to. This is the best hole in the wall, the best Mexican restaurant in town. And I thought, is this really the best? So I thought, let's give it a shot. So I go over, it's in a sketchy part of town, but as soon as you walk in, it's really nice and clean, and the staff is very friendly. And I put in my order, and I go and sit down at a table, and they bring out my food, and it's still nice and warm, and I take my first bite. And I remember, with food still in my mouth, I gave an audible, wow. It was fantastic. In fact, it reminded me of the food that I've had in Mexico, which to me, that is the standard of Mexican food. And if you know me, I don't really leave reviews for anything. But this was so good that I felt compelled to share this place with other people. And so I wrote, a Google review myself, and I said, this is one of the best Mexican restaurants I've been to in the Phoenix area. 10 out of 10 would recommend, and I got a thumbs up. Somebody found this useful. So, you know, the reality is that our society is obsessed with the best. We want the best food. We want the best uh, restaurants to eat at. We want the best customer service. We want the best experience at our hotel or at our vacation. We want the best prices at the gas pump or at the grocery store. We want the best. In fact, a quick uh, search in the dictionary for the definition of this word, it's of the most excellent, effective, or desirable type or quality. It's the best of the best. Few words can define themselves, but I think the best is really the best. But no matter how great our obsession, no matter how great our desire is for the best, it pales in comparison to God's desire for the best. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. It's about bringing our best. In fact, Paul would say in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily, bring your best as for the Lord and not for men. So the Bible tells us that we should bring our best, but there's a catch. God says, don't bring your best for man. Don't bring your best, as some people, people might say, to prove it to yourself. Don't bring your best to prove somebody else wrong. Don't bring your best to gain something like wealth or, or comfort or popularity or status. You don't bring your best for man. You bring your best for me, God says. We bring our best for God. And it doesn't matter if we're young or old, we can bring our best. It doesn't matter what our race is, what our background is, 
what uh, our history is. It doesn't matter if we're male or female, if we were baptized yesterday, or we have 50, 60, 70 plus years in Christ. We can all bring our best. But notice how it says, whatever you do. It's not bring your best only on Sundays. It's not bring your best only when I'm at work and I'm at my job and I don't really have to bring my best when I'm at home or when no one else is around. No, God says whatever you do, you bring your best. Whether that's at work or at school or at home or where, when there's no one else around and most especially when it comes to worshiping God Bring your best. And so let's start off with the question, well, why why should I bring my best? You know, that sounds like a lot of hard work. Bringing my best, that sounds like a lot of effort that I have to put in. That sounds like a big time commitment. Why should I bring my best? And remember, it's the best for God. And so let's get the first one out of the way. The fact of the matter is we should bring our best because, well, God is the best. God is the best. Am I right? God is the Creator of the universe, of everything that we know and see. We read Genesis chapter 1 often as Christians. The narration of creation. But I fear that as, we're, as we continue to read this over and over and over again throughout our lifetime, we begin to, to get numb to just how incredible and mind-blowing it is that God created everything into existence by speaking it into existence. Isn't that incredible? We, we read that chapter like, like it's a history book or like a phone book when we should read it with awe. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God is the best. The psalmist would say in Psalm 19 and verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. We've been blessed the past couple of weeks with some beautiful just amazing sunsets and sunrises. And we often say God is the best artist. We say the sky is His canvas and God is the best painter. God is the best. We also read in Psalm 46 and verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. When was the last time that in the middle of your busy schedule, you, you took some time to step back from all of it. To, to put aside all your anxieties, all your problems, all your worries, and just recognize that God is still God. That God is still on His throne. That God is still in control. That God is the best. And so I should give God my best. Because He is the best. But I think the most obvious reason why we should bring our best to God is because God said so. God demands that we bring our best. And we already read Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23 where it says, Bring your best. Work heartily as for the Lord and not for man. But the truth is, God has always wanted the best from His people. Since the beginning, God has desired the best from His people. In fact, if we go to the Old Testament, the book of Malachi chapter 1, in Malachi chapter 1, we see that God is angry with His people. He's getting after the Jewish nation. Why? Because they were not giving God the best. And in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 6, The Bible says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest, who despise my name. 
Now jump down to verse 13. It says, But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. God desired the best from His people. The commandments that He gave to the Jewish nation was, I want you to sacrifice to Me the best. The fattest calf. God wanted them to to sacrifice the best of the best. The first of their produce. The firstborn from among their flock. God wanted the best, but they were not giving God the best. In fact, they were giving Him the worst. They looked at the best that they had and they said, I think I'm going to keep that for myself. I'm going to keep the best for me and I don't think God will mind. I will just give Him what I don't really want. What I can live without. What I don't really need. And they were giving to God the lame, the blind, even what was stolen. They were giving to God garbage. And God was not pleased with that. God has always desired the best from His people and He continues to want the best from us today. And so we should bring our best. Why? Because God is the best and because God demands that we bring our best, but also because God has given me His best. Um, You know, our theme for the year is abounding in grace. And I look forward to Sean's lesson later this morning where he'll be talking precisely on the grace of God. But the question that we should always ask when it comes to the grace of God is, how do I respond to that grace? You know, we know the famous verse, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is so wonderful. And, you know, people do nice things for us. People might open the door for us when we're still 10 feet away. People do nice things for us like they pick up something off the floor that we may have dropped. People do nice things for us, like sharing a snicker bar with us. But the grace of God isn't Him opening the door for us when we're still 10 feet away. The grace of God isn't Him picking something up for for us that we may have dropped. The grace of God isn't Him sharing a snickers bar with us. The grace of God is the best from God. It's Him giving us His only Son. It's Him giving us Himself to us. He's revealing Himself to us. Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. You know, in the original Greek, Paul uses a phrase that is not grammatically correct. The phrase that he uses, I find that he's trying to describe what God can do for us, but there's no other way to describe it than by using this phrase, and that phrase is exceedingly abundantly. God can do for us exceedingly abundantly more than we could possibly think or ask. And in the context of what Paul is asking for here in the previous verses, Paul is praying to God for spiritual strength. God can grant us spiritual strength exceedingly abundantly more than we could possibly imagine. And Paul is praying 
that Jesus may dwell inside Christians, and God can grant us that exceedingly abundantly more than we could possibly imagine. And, God, and Paul also prays uh, that we might be able to understand, that we may be able to have the wisdom, the capacity to know the love of God and the fullness of God. And guess what? God can grant that to us exceedingly abundantly more than we could possibly imagine. And so God has not only given us His best, but He continues to give us His best every single day. And the question is, do I give God my best? Do I give God my best if He has given me His best, or do I keep my best for myself? We should bring our best because God is the best. Because God demands my best. Because God has given and continues to give me His best. But also because my brothers and sisters, they need my best. I mean, this is true if you've ever been in a, a sports team. The success of the team depends on every single player bringing their best. We depend on each other. And this reminds me of the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain was angry that God was pleased with his brother Abel's sacrifice, but God was not pleased with his. And so he lashes out in anger and he murders his own brother. And God comes to him and, and he asks, where is your brother Abel? To which Cain responds, am I my brother's keeper? Am I responsible for my brother? Do I look like my brother's nanny? And the implied answer to that question is, yes, Cain. You are your brother's keeper. You are responsible for looking out for your brother, and so are we. We are our brother and sister's keeper. We do look out for each other. I mean, there's a reason why we are called the family of God. Why we are brothers and sisters in Christ because as a family, we look out for each other. But how can I expect that my brother or sister who is discouraged, how can I expect them to be encouraged once again if I'm not doing my part and bringing my best to encourage them? How can I expect that when a brother or sister is in need, and they're seeking help. How can I expect them to receive that help if I'm not bringing my best and taking the initiative to help them myself, knowing I have the opportunity, but instead I say, oh, somebody else will do it. Somebody else will take care of their need. I don't have to do it. I don't have to bring my best. The success of a church depends on the individual members bringing their best. If not, as Paul or the Hebrew writer would put it in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. Why? Why should we exhort each other every day so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin? We put each other at risk of falling into sin, of leaving the Lord if we're not looking out for each other. We bring our best, not only because God is the best, because God demands my best, because He's given me His best, but also because my brothers and sisters, they need my best. And so we know why we should bring our best. But let's ask another question. What does the best look like? What does it look like in my daily life? What does it look like if I am truly bringing my best to God? Well, I want to suggest to you four, four things of what the best looks like. The first of which is, it looks like not being satisfied with as little as possible. You know, there's no such thing as a regular Christian. 
God is not pleased with mediocre Christianity. There are people out there that just want to do the least that they can just to get by. There are people out there who just want to do the bare minimum. This is true at school. Have you seen them? They ask questions like, uh, teacher, what is the, le the lowest grade I can get? Just to pass. This is true uh, in the workplace. Hey boss, what's the least amount of work I can do to not get fired and still get paid? And unfortunately, this is also true among Christians. The Christian that just wants to do the bare minimum asks questions like, do I really have to go to Wednesday night Bible class? How often should I assemble with the church? They ask questions like, how much should I give on the first day of the week? Or how many people do I have to preach the Gospel to? Those are the kinds of questions that people who are satisfied with as little as possible are, are asking. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Always abounding. Always seeking to do more for the Lord. Are we bringing our best to God? Or are we just doing the bare minimum? Instead of asking questions like, should I come to Wednesday night Bible study? Do I have to come to Wednesday night Bible studies? Or how often should I assemble with the church? Instead of asking that question, why don't you ask, can I do more for the church? Is there a way I can possibly teach a Bible class? Is there a way I can have opportunities to participate more? Do more for the Lord. Instead of asking, uh, how many people should I preach the Gospel to? Why don't you ask, uh, how can I create an opportunity to preach the Gospel to my neighbor? How can I create more opportunities to preach the Gospel to those who are around me? Instead of asking, how much should I give to the Lord on the first day of the week? Why don't you ask, how much more can I give to the Lord? We need to bring our best. And the best looks like not being satisfied with as little as possible. But it also looks like making decisions based on what glorifies God the most. Are you familiar with one of these? I know that those of you who are in school maybe are squirming in your seats right now. I'm not the biggest fan of tests. I don't like really staying up late at night studying for tests and the stress that comes along with tests. And especially I'm not a fan of tests when there are questions like this one. Choose the most correct answer. Are you telling me there's more than one right answer? <laughs> well, yes. But there is the best answer. And the same thing goes with the way we should look at our decision making. There's, just, there's not just good and bad. There's good and bad and the best. Jesus is a prime example of this. Remember in John chapter 11, when Jesus hears news of Lazarus that he is deathly ill, when Jesus hears of, of, these, of this news, he immediately runs and goes to Lazarus. Is that what he does? No, he waits two days. Jesus waits two days. He, he doesn't react like you and I might have reacted, he doesn't react like you and I might expect. Jesus waits. And after the two days, then He goes. But by that point, it's too late. And Martha recognizes, Jesus, if You would have been here earlier, You could have saved Lazarus. But now it's too late. 
So why did Jesus wait two days? Well, the answer is in verse 4 of chapter 11. But when Jesus heard these new, this news, He said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. You know, if Jesus would have gone immediately to the aid of Lazarus and healed him and cured him from his illness, that sure would have been a great miracle. That would have glorified God. Surely, it would have given more proof to the person that He was claiming to be. But that was not Jesus' mentality. His mentality wasn't what is good and what is bad. is what is the best. Healing Lazarus while he was still alive would have given God glory. But waiting two days and letting him die and letting him rot a little bit, and then raising him from the dead, gave God the most glory. And so we should look at every decision that we make. Does this God give God the most glory? We just had a marriage class recently in the back, and we, we looked at the Bible is clear that it's not a sin for a believer to marry an unbeliever. It's actually it's a great blessing. Marriage is such a great blessing. Marriage brings glory to God. But does a believer marrying an unbeliever give the most glory to God? Knowing that it can put my spiritual life at risk. It can pull, that person can pull me away from God. And it will make it so much harder to teach my kids about the Lord. Marriage is, it gives glory to God. But the person that we choose to, are we asking the question, does this give the most glory to God? And so that is what the best looks like. But it also looks like knowing it can put me in uncomfortable positions. Can I share a story with you? My, my dad, when I was younger, my dad used to be in the oil fields. He used to work in the oil fields. And to be honest, we were pretty well financially. There was no problems at all. Uh, we, we had everything that we needed. The problem, though, was because of the nature of my dad's job, he would work two weeks and then be at home for two weeks which means he was at church two Sundays out of the month, but he was not two Sundays out of the month. And he said it started to take a toll on his spiritual life. So one day he made the decision to quit his job. And those were some tough times ahead. My parents struggled financially. And I still remember. And they almost lost the house. They were in big trouble. But my dad was there every single Sunday. And he was with his family, not just two weeks out of the month, but every single week. And someone might look at that situation and be like, why would he do that? Why would he give up his job? Everything was going well. There was nothing wrong, and now you're putting your family through this situation? Why would you do that? Well, my dad realized he wasn't bringing his best to God. And in order to do that, he had to give up his job. And I am so thankful that he did. Because who knows where I would be if he hadn't made that decision. An uncomfortable decision. But one that would bring his best effort to God. And a great example. Maybe bringing my best means I have to be in an uncomfortable position. Maybe bringing my best means I have, I have to give up that job and look for a different job that will allow me to worship God with the church every Sunday. 
maybe it might mean bringing my best, might mean I have to be a little bit more of an extrovert and get out of my comfort zone to get to know my brother or sister a little bit better. Maybe it means that I have to end a relationship or a friendship because it's taken a toll on my spiritual life. Maybe bringing my best means I have to be in an uncomfortable position. But that's what God requires from us. It's a sacrifice. And lastly, the best looks like having a real passion and zeal for God. Jesus said in Mark chapter 12 and verse 30, after they asked Jesus, Jesus, what is the most important commandment? Jesus says, the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the basis of Christianity. This is our core of being a Christian, what it means to be a Christian. But do we have a passion and a zeal for God? Do you, can you, do you know how you can tell when someone has a passion for something? When someone is truly passionate about something, you can tell you know how? They can't stop talking about it. It's all over. It's plastered all over their room. It's all over their phone. They can't stop talking about it. They can't stop thinking about what they're passionate about. Uh, maybe you've met someone who is passionate about a, a sport or a sports team. They can't stop talking about it. Or someone who is passionate about a certain type of music or artist they can't stop talking about them. They can't stop listening to their, their work, their music. Are we passionate about God? Do, do people uh, look at us and, and say, oh, here we go again. He's talking about God again. This guy won't stop talking about God. And you might sit there and think, I think I'm passionate about God. I, I think I, I truly love the Lord. But may I challenge you, reading Psalm 119 and verse 62, the psalmist says, At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. <laughs> At midnight? When I'm supposed to be sleeping? Well, I rarely get up in the middle of the night, but I remember being a little kid. And I knew that the next day I was going to go on some fun adventure or a, a fantastic vacation. I could not sleep at night. Not because I was stressed, but because I was so excited. I was looking forward to that. And I would maybe fall asleep, but I would wake up a short time later just thinking about that vacation. Are we that passionate about God? that we can wake up in the middle of the night just feeling so full of praise and thankfulness to God that we wake up in the middle of the night maybe sing a song and worship to God and pray to God. Do we bring the best to the Lord? Does this look like your life? If not, we all have something to work on. We're all trying to pursue uh, the best, to bring the best for God. And if you're sitting here this morning and you realize, well, I've been a Christian, but I, am, I haven't been bringing my best to the Lord. And maybe you need the prayers of the congregation to help you do that. Or maybe you're visiting with us tonight and you realize I haven't ever given the best to the Lord, but I need to. And the best thing you can bring to the Lord right now is your life. And if you're willing to confess your sins and be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins, 
we can help you with that as well. Whatever your need may be, please come forward, make it known as we stand, as we sing. In Christ.